So the topic which has been chosen by me, Indian sandwood revival and utilization. Let me start uh, my presentation with a wonderful quote, uh, uh, which was given by uh, Nobel laureate Gurudev, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, the sandwood species as such is such a divine species that, you know, uh, his statements summarizes what the tree is and what it is to be. The sandalwood tree, as if to prove how sweet to conquer hate, love, perfumes the axe that lays its low. In fact, the photograph, what you are seeing, uh, the, the photograph, what you are seeing there is uh, one of the huge sandalwood tree that was picturized sometime in 1992. Uh, which uh, we all believe that it may not be existing now. Maybe I would get, give an answer at the end of my lecture where things are still prevailing and things are still happening. One of the few species, you know, which is uh, a sort of uh, uh, part and parcel and uh, integrated to our culture and heritage. And when it comes to the research perspective, yeah, it has been worked for more than 150 years. And as a uh, uh, rightfully mentioned by Dr. Prabuddha, it has been categorized as vulnerable uh, way back in 1997, and it still remains in the same status of being vulnerable under vulnerable category. Let us just quickly go through what exactly was the work that was done on sandalwood. See, the parasitic nature of sandalwood was the, something was the first thing that was uh, when it comes to the research on sandalwood was thought about way back in 1871. The first uh, report uh, that came, which mentioned that. Sandwood is a partial root parasite, followed by, you know, the, the, the most uh, um, devastating disease with which sandwood is associated and susceptible, the spike disease, sometime in 1899. In fact, I would just give this small story about uh, what happened between 1903 and 1910. Nearly 7 lakh sandwood trees were uprooted in Mysore uh, alone. The Mysore, I mean, the, uh, the, Mysore, the, the Mysore state and the Karnataka, I mean, sorry, and the Kurg, you know, both the, both the areas included. Uh, which translated roughly to around 35 lakh rupees in those days. And seeing the extent of damage that was done in 1903, uh, the government of Mysore then offered a, an award of rupees 10,000 for finding cure for sandwood spike. And to the best of our knowledge, it has not yet been claimed by anyone till now. Yeah. Uh, that was just to give you an idea of uh, uh, how exactly sandwood as a species and IWST has been involved. The Forest Research Laboratory, which has been established in 1938 by His Highness uh, Rajarishi Nalwadi Krishna Raja Odeyar uh, desired that uh, work related to sandalwood has to be carried out because in one of his visits sometime in 1914 uh, and uh, which also resulted in the formation of the present Karnataka Soap Detergents Limited uh, uh, when he visited the uh, sandalwood Koti which was adjoining to our institute and found that quite a lot of uh, logs being kept as such and not being exported he realized that something has to be done for uh, sandalwood and uh, that's how uh, the famous uh, Karnataka Soap Detergents Limited started, and over a period of time, this forest research laboratory also started. And it's with its reorganization in 1956 as a regional center, regional research center of FRI and C. Uh, can you believe that an exclusive division was established in the name of Sandwood Spike, uh, and um, progress towards Sandwood research continued. But the but the turning point or the golden period for Sandwood research was the establishment of Sandwood Research Center. Perhaps to the best of our knowledge. Uh, this could be the one of the only uh, institute from a tree perspective which has been named you know unlike you know if you take icr institutes which have various uh, research institutes uh, crop research institute but in 1977 uh, the sandalwood research center was set up to undertake research on wide ranging aspects of silviculture genetics and management of sandalwood yeah and uh, uh, if you recollect some of the initial uh, uh, talks where they talk about uh, when we talk about forest genetic resource, one of the first most basic information is to explore and uh, to see the exact distribution of the species. So um, the first sandalwood survey was started sometime in 78, 80, and then this is how the map looks like. And if you see the predominantly the southern part of Karnataka and northern part of Tamil Nadu is the hub of sandalwood uh, uh, area, and we have we we see. Quite a bit of sandwood being distributed across the country. Uh, interestingly, if you see uh, the Wadayars, uh, the, 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 the famous Maharajas of Mysore, uh, if you look at their lineage, they come basically from Gujarat. 
so what it means to say also that you know the sandwood the distribution if you look into you know some of these princely states uh, had uh, a sandwood uh, uh, being cultivated or being uh, grown there it could be either maharashtra a bit a uh, partly of rajasthan and gujarat and to a certain extent in uh, madhya pradesh sioni where you know all these were princely states so uh, as per the uh, data from 78 80 the distribution was around 9034 square kilometers of which karnataka and tamil nadu contributed nearly 90% of the population and the criteria which was used to identify these uh, population were population density tree size and hardwood depth subsequently uh, around 79 plus trees were or candidate plus trees were identified and uh, uh, assembled uh, in um, some of the research plots which i will be coming in my uh, next slide where these where these uh, 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 plus trees were identified based on fast growth hardwood content oil content spike disease hardwood borer and hardwood rot and predominantly around 70 uh, genotypes or the superior genotypes were from karnataka and tamil nadu followed by 3 and 6 from kerala and andhra pradesh respectively i just want to give you a brief idea of Uh, how a golden period can enhance as far as research activities are concerned just between 80 to 84 if you look at it so many research trials were established as far as tree improvement is concerned and uh, uh, if we go back if 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 we look at the harsh reality now i think uh, the the one in the red clonal germplasm bank gotipura hoskote bangalore is still surviving and just immediately following it is the kurumbapatti selam tamil nadu which is still surviving apart from that none of these plots do exist for certain obvious reasons which you would all know uh, under world bank aided uh, forest research extension project uh, we had uh, a research on sandalwood and uh, iwst identified nine provinces of sandalwood three from uh, karnataka two from tamil nadu along with that we had one from kerala orissa madhya pradesh and andhra pradesh so that way um, we had that opportunity of identifying nine provinces and we also established one seed orchard and seedling uh, seedling seed orchard so the first question that comes to our mind especially when we talk about a particular species or when we talk about forestic resources does the species harbor variability and does it you know call for certain improvement studies yes uh, quickly if you look at it there is variation in bark color texture and thickness and if you look into the flowering part of it uh, nearly 60% of the trees uh, flowers twice a year and only around 4% 4% uh, flowers throughout the year and uh, seeds have shown polymorphic characters in size shape irrigation i mean germination and vigor when it comes to the leaf uh, types we have uh, six types of leaves uh, and the ovate being the common one interestingly all these you know six types of leaves are quite discernible at juvenile stage and overall to sum it up we have this population diversity diversity studies using molecular markers has also sufficiently uh, reported that a considerable variation do exist as far as indian sandalwood is concerned so whenever we talk about sandalwood it's these two traits which matter the most to us the hardwood and the oil let me just uh, go through what sort of studies that have been carried out on these two important aspects though we categorically mentioned that more than 150 years back since 150 years extensive research is being carried out way back in 1869 uh, ludlow tells that maturity age and quality of growth and would all depended on soil and in 1904 ramrao mentions that yes there is variation you know with reference to hardwood in in terms of its girth class and uh, also in the individuals of the same girth class and uh, cameroon significantly tells that trees attain commercial maturity at around 27 to 30 years an interesting study was done by puran singh in 1911 and 1915 in a uh, place at uh, forest research institute dehradun where uh, uh, he found that the trees growing in fertile soils had lesser oil content and compared to trees growing in poor rocky and gravelly soils and uh, neither elevation age nor uh, neither elev uh, elevation age nor locality has any definite relationship when it comes to sandalwood oil percentage uh, interestingly the the number of samples that were taken was around 15 and 40 respectively uh, but however uh, troop and fisher when they report uh, about the formation of hardwood and oil they still they still considered that you know lot of studies were needed the prestigious uh, silviculture conference that used to be held in dehradun Uh, in the fifth silviculture conference michel comes out with uh, a very very uh, strong statement it will take a long time to determine factors ideal for formation of hardwood and increasing the oil content merits investigation is what he sums up in his comments 
in the same conference, Laurie tells that the quantity of hardwood in a tree of a given size is found to be found to vary to a baffling degree. You know, the word baffling degree really, really uh, gives us a perspective of how exactly, you know, the, the these two traits of what we commonly use in case of sandwood, the hardwood and oil. And Venkatrao tells that uh, factors having deleterious, deleterious effect on normal growth is conducive to the formation of hardwood because he identifies the wood in knots and tells that. And uh, he also tells that uh, dry locality having scanty rainfall or a clay soil combined with paucity of host plants may be contributing causes for the low oil content. So, you know, there is a contrasting evidences and all these things are some of the observations that are being made by those senior authors. In uh, uh, 1959, uh, Rao suggested, suggested that hardwood formation in evaluating sandwood trees for their production of aromatic wood using wood cores is one option by which studies are to con uh, continued. And in um, Indian Science con con Congress, Butnagar reports that, uh, I mean, he suggests that uh, full, I mean, sandal takes uh, uh, nearly 50 to 80 years for its full maturity and the tree may reach physiological maturity without forming any hardwood. So if you, if, if, I mean, if you look back into all these uh, uh, studies, you can very clearly tell that, you know, the hardwood and oil still remains a very, very enigmatic thing. So the first All India Sandwood Seminar was held in 1977 in uh, Karnataka under the aegis of Karnataka Forest Department and uh, uh, Kaikini then, the chief conservator of forest, uh, observes that, you know, he suggests that rate of hardwood formation in sandwood and the diverse conditions of growth and on the oil content of such wood is still not studied well and needs considerable research. And estimating the rate of growth with the rate of hardwood formation is the need of the day then. Four years later, again, in uh, we had the second sandwood seminar in uh, Salem. Shenmugnathan tells, formation of hardwood has not been subjected to much critical study so far. Remember, it's already more than 100 years that, you know, that we started getting, realizing that not much of information was available and studies on the growth rate and hardwood yield have to be intensified. So to say, when it comes to some of these uh, research work, uh, it was for the first time in 17, 1979, uh, Mr. Venkateshan, who was also a very much part and parcel of uh, uh, Sandlord Research Center and who was the director then, uh, came out with uh, uh, a sort of a table uh, suggesting uh, in case of Tamil Nadu forest conditions, what could be the average yield? And uh, according to him, each tree can yield at least one kg per year after 20 years. So why I'm telling all these things are because, you know, once, uh, well, you know, uh, Sandlord is gradually coming into the forte of cultivation practices. So from that perspective, when you look into these data, this carries, these data carries a lot of uh, uh, relevance. And this is just to quickly give you about uh, how exactly the oil part of it varies. So sometime in 1981, Jayapatal uh, uh, studied uh, quite extensively on uh, uh, oil related aspects, especially uh, from uh, alpha and beta centralol along with the oil content and you see the extent of the, uh, you, and, and, and you can see the you can notice the variation that exists you know as low as 2.42 to 6.8.43 and uh, whereas the alpha content uh, alpha and beta centralol content are varying from 94% to 88.07% so just to give you an idea to what extent this particular trait is variable what we did was we tried to look into some of the old literature dig it and find out uh, how exactly, what were the different studies? So, you know, we try to see what exactly uh, were different studies or the different reports that were carried out, uh, at least considering minimum of 10 trees from each location uh, and uh, what has been reported as far as uh, uh, the hardwood percentage or hardwood variation is concerned. You see some interesting studies, uh, Sioni, you know, which had around 30 centimeter girth or 10 centimeter dia. And if you look at Kurumbapati in Salem, you know, which had around 20 centimeter, uh, uh, dia, uh, which uh, roughly comes to around 30, cent I mean, 60 centimeter girth, nearly 20% of the trees did not have hardwood there. And uh, in case of Dindigal, again, which is a sandwood uh, bearing area, 30 centimeter girth trees, around half of the trees did not have hardwood. And if you see, again, hardwood percentage, which varies from uh, uh, as low as uh, uh, 26 to as high as 47% is something, you know, these are all which we see in case of natural population. Um, a very interesting study, which I thought I should bring to your uh, uh, notice, is that in this campus, in the Sandlu Research, uh, I mean, the Forest Research Laboratory campus, uh, an interesting study was done. What they did was they tried to collect the samples uh, from the trees between 10 to 11 centimeter girth, or approximately, you know, the average uh, coming to 11 centimeter. And uh, uh, when they tried to see 
what sort of a variation occurs as far as uh, hardwood color is concerned? So there is brown and yellow is brown, nearly 44% of the population had brown and 28%. So again, remember this is all from a single locality of a, of a say, not more than a, uh, 25 acre uh, area. And uh, what is more important is the, uh, the hardwood percentage and the corresponding coefficient of variation value. So the hardwood percentage was around 43.45, but the coefficient of variation value was as high as 41.37%, which sufficiently indicates the extent of variation within the locality for a similar girth tree. So it was concluded that there's no fixed year when the hardwood starts forming. It can start as early as five to six years in some trees and as late as over 15 years. I just uh, show the you know the show the same relationship uh, for that particular data in the form of a graphical representation, and you see how exactly the uh, the trees are distributed. Uh, and uh, even if you see uh, just the girth at uh, 11 centimeter or the tree dia, sorry, tree dia at 11 centimeter, and uh, you see the number of trees uh, and the heart radial proportion that's varying. So uh, just to give you a glimpse of exactly again how how much is the variability. So, as you all know, this oil content decreases along the length of the tree and across the tree. And uh, it's believed that light brown colored wood contains higher oil than the dark colored ones. And um, um, there is around 45% uh, decrease in the oil content from root to tip and about 20% from core to periphery when we look at radially. The root has around 3 to 6% oil, while uh, stem can range from 225 to 5% oil. And there are, you know, in branches, uh, we find oil. I think obviously they are from very, very old trees, I suppose. So correlation studies showed that oil content becomes nearly constant once the tree reaches around 80 centimeter. So if we go back and see what exactly were the inherent issues in these all these studies that were carried out, one is lack of sandwood plantations. You know, sandwood pl availability of sandwood plantations were, I would say, something. You know, I don't mind saying it as 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 as, as it was nearing to the nil, uh, because there were not many sandwood plantations. And uh, the second most issue was the unknown age and the growing conditions were not similar and sample size were of very few trees. So what happened, we really started questioning whether what all these inherent variations, what we are getting is because of these uh, uh, associated issues which were much beyond the control of, of control of researchers. So then we thought, okay, let us look into uh, uh, one particular uh, um, uh, germplasm bank, which was established, as I have uh, mentioned to you earlier. The advantages of this were uniform age, uniform growing conditions, accessions from different areas, and it was an ideal age for estimating variability. So the accessions, we had around the 37 accessions, though the 70 accessions, what I mentioned earlier, by then, uh, you know, st to consider statistically uh, normal, uh, statistically accepted study, we could only... Uh, catch hold of 37 accessions, and we came out with some interesting studies. Out of those 37 accessions, in five accessions, hardwood had not formed. And believe me, this was at age of 20 years. And uh, what is important for me, for us to see here is, look into the CV of uh, hardwood diameter and oil content, 24 and 27%. And uh, uh, approximately 14% of the trees did not have hardwood at the age of 20 years. So, uh, I would just uh, like to replicate uh, the same uh, uh, girth data which was done sometime in 1985-86 and the same one which we did at the age of 20 years uh, across the accessions, keeping 11 as the uh, girth uh, or the diameter. Uh, you can just uh, uh, see the variation. It varies from 0.62 to 2.29 in case of oil percent and 29 to 65% in hardwood proportion. And for instance, we just took one clone to give you an idea of K11, how exactly, you know, having a similar girth, more or less 35, 31, 38.5 centi centimeters, and uh, uh, see the extent of uh, uh, hardwood proportion varying from 26 to 48%. So just to give you an idea of now, if you look back the earlier studies, there were some inherent variation. If you look back this study, some of those conditions were under our control, but still the inherent variation was this much. However, a sort of a consoling thing was, yes, when we try to see a relationship between the girth and hardwood, we had a very, uh, we had a strong relationship. I would not use the word very because it's a very subjective term. But, but when it comes to tree improvement, even in case of trees, even a mere uh, 0.6 is, is considered as quite a big uh, uh, achievement. 
And we had a strong relationship between GERD and Hartwood content, which, which in a way tells that, look here, when you are trying to identify some superior genotypes, uh, at least uh, GERD could be also considered as a surrogate factor, uh, unlike in most of the other tree species. However, uh, there was no relationship between hardwood and oil content, uh, which we 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 uh, attribute that you know the process of uh, hardwood and oil may not happen simultaneously in the sense oil cannot form without the hardwood presence. But however, once the oil starts forming, it is not necessary that it has to move at a very uh, uh, high pace such that you know it matches the hardwood. So considering this, you know, there was no relationship between hardwood and oil content. On the other hand, it would also give us a very good opportunity and option to identify some of those genotypes, you know, which is having uh, higher oil content and higher hardwood too. So we say that process of hardwood formation and for the oil product, uh, production are two independent process, but this relationship may become a strong relationship. Maybe if we had done it in case of trees, which may be 50 years or 60 years old, uh, but which I feel again, uh, that sort of a situation can never arrive, uh, at least in the next uh, 20, 30 years in case of sandwood. Uh, I would bring this interesting study that was done in Australia. Uh, friends, uh, I, I, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, submit to this August gathering that uh, India has lost its place as far as Indian sandwood is concerned. Uh, the harsh truth, and we have to accept it. Uh, sandwood Plantations have come in a massive way in Australia, and uh, it seems uh, it's always uh, the known fact that China, you know, usually keeps things very guarded, and it's believed that China is also coming with large-scale plantations there. And here is an interesting study. When, you know, why, I, why I put this particular interesting study is for the reason that when um, way back in 1998, when Australia started cultivating sandalwood, and they assured, you know, to the global market that you know by 2014 they'll be glutting the sandalwood market. Uh, but no, it did not happen. They said by the end of 14 or 15 years, we are going to harvest the, harvest the trees and there will be huge uh, availability of uh, trees uh, in the global arena. There's one uh, uh, scientist, Jonathan Brand, who came out with a very interesting study where they did study on 32 trees. And uh, out of those 32 trees, something, you know, uh, what akin to what we did it at the end of 16. I mean, we did it for 20 years when they did it for 16 years. Um, uh, if you see, in case of three trees, the hardwood had not at all formed. And if you look into the number of trees, uh, nearly 20 trees could produce around two to four kgs, out of which around nine trees did not produce, you know, the hardwood was less than a kg. So why, why I have put this uh, is this same uh, Mr. Dr. Brand suggested that uh, whatever be the claims or whatever be the assurances given by various people and various organizations, uh, at least keeping 20 years as a minimum rotation would be a, vi a viable way for sandalwood cultivation. Oil content ranged from 2.9 to 6.2 percent in their study. Uh, may, may I intervene, sir? Uh, is it the same species, sir, uh, which is grown in Australia or it is some other species? Uh, no, sir. It is Santalum album only, sir. It's Indian sandalwood only. In fact, uh, uh, there are um, uh, you know various, uh, you know, uh, considering uh, uh, it's a closed group, I would always tell that, you know, there are various uh, um, comments that come out when it comes to how it reached there, what they say is, you know, um, they got the seed material from uh, Indonesia and uh, Hawaiian Islands, which were supposed to be the uh, sandwood uh, growing area. But there was also a school of thought which tells that most of the sandwood plantations uh, that has come from, uh, that has come in Australia is of Indian origin. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, you know, I do not like get into the controversy, but then, uh, yes, we have been the loser. And it is certain that it is Santalum album only. Though Australia do have one more uh, um, uh, Santalum species, Santalum spicatum, but it's nowhere compared to Santalum album, sir. So this particular paper, uh, what Brand has given, uh, published in 2012, is from Santalum album itself. I uh, hope I have- Okay, sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so now we just go, go ahead with the one interesting study, what we did it, uh, um, it was an 18 year old plantation uh, without any specific spacing. What has happened is uh, this particular uh, sandwood cultivator uh, grower had uh, just planted uh, sandwood uh, randomly across, you know, uh, maybe some of them were in line plantation and it was spread across in his uh, uh, farm. And when uh, out uh, and when 76 trees were harvested uh, from this 18 year old trees, uh, 10 trees did not have hardwood. And I'm just giving you the girth of the trees which did not have a hardwood. 
And believe me, only two trees had hard, had a hardwood greater than 50%. Um, yeah, I thought I'll just share this particular data with you all. Um, see, 10 trees having lowest hardwood content, you know, just to give you a glimpse of, it varied from 0.99 to 1.55%, uh, uh, and uh, the girth varied from 40 to 40 centimeter to 32 centimeter. And uh, in the other, other table, I've just given you a graph of, I mean, a table of uh, trees having, you know, uh, high hardwood area in percentage. Uh, I have marked one tree, which is which was supposed to be the largest girth tree there of uh, 73 centimeters, had around 29% hardwood area. And again, the tree which had a highest girth of 59.63 was, I mean, uh, highest hardwood area had only 30, 31 centimeter girth. So what I want to tell is growing sand load is one thing, but it's always important to remember that this sort of variation exists. So what are the gray areas in sand load research? So we say that we have been uh, doing extensive research for the past 150 years. Uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, a humble submission to accept that still there are considerable gray areas as far as sand load research is concerned. Uh, let us not accept that it is our failure, but we should also accept that how a tree behaves and how it performs. So from that perspective, when you look at it, uh, sirs, and Madam Hartwood and its formation is yet to be you know, understood properly. It's not only sand load. Let me be very, very frank. It's cut across most of the trees. It's still a gray area. Role of genetics and improvement in a uh, role of genetics and environment in hardwood formation is, is still not properly understood. You know, we are still groping in dark. And I'm sure the data what we provided you for all these, you know, from our earlier slides would definitely give you a thought that, yes, quite a bit of study is needed. Uh, and interestingly, you know, understanding biosynthetic pathway of oil formation is still not clear. You know, though again, uh, I mean, why to tell that? Forget about the biosynthetic pathway. If I have to put it this way, um, oil industry is supposed to be considered one of the oldest industry, you know, when we talk about industry. And uh, can you believe that sandwood oil, sandwood oil has not been synthesized, though, you know, there are various uh, oil that come in the market, which tells that nearer to that, and it's never ever a sandwood oil. So even, even now, sandwood oil as such has, I mean, uh, has not been uh, uh, synthesized. And uh, yes, as in my initial slide, when I talked about the spike disease, remedy for spike disease on sandwood remains elusive. Harsh truth, but let us accept it. Nothing wrong in that. So uh, let me just give you a glimpse of what are the inherent disadvantages and advantages of this wonderful species. Yes, predominantly found in two southern states, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And I'm telling you, predominantly found in two southern states, I'm giving, you know, I would attribute it to the was, was, you know, <laughs> it's was predominantly found. Uh, yes, it was considered as a royal tree in the recent past. Sometimes, you know, you would also agree um, some tags can add as a, you know, uh, I would say a hangman's knot. And typically, a royal tree status was a hangman's knot for sandwood also in its own way. Um, let us accept this also. In-situ conservation has been very, very difficult. And as uh, I think if some of the forest officers in the southern part of India who are here would always uh, uh, strongly support me in this particular statement. It's not, an, it's not a joke at all to go for in-situ conservation uh, as far as sandwood concerned. And uh, yes, when we considered it as a royal tree and it was given a tag of royal tree, there were the plantations. And whatever we talk about sandwood, can you believe me, sirs, that even today, even today we are grouping in the dark and we are trying to get bare minimum growth data. You know, 150 years of research work. Where's the growth data? If you ask me, I'll tell, sir, we are at it and we are continuing with it. So information about its growth is still scarce. And interestingly, sir, it's not simply the biomass that matters, sir. What matters is the hardwood and oil. Only then the tree, you know, gets its uh, value. But as a tree, what are the real, uh, inherent advantages as a species? If you look into the ecologically, I mean, the, the, the where exactly it's distributed, it grows in the harshest of the condition. So we say it's a very hardy species. Not many trees do flower twice a year. Yes, sandwood does it. Beautifully cross-pollinated, you know, if you see, if you see sandwood, you know, I will, I'll give you a very interesting example. I think uh, that, was started, that was published. In one acre uh, area, if you raise a sandalwood tree and protect it, it has an ability of giving you nearly five to 8,000 saplings 
at the end of 10 to 12 years. You know, that's the extent of regeneration capacity because it's being disseminated. So that's what we mean by huge regeneration capacity. And interestingly, it has a good coppicing ability too. And fortunately, at least for the two states here, when I say relaxed government policy, it is fortunately for the two states, government of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, we have this policy being relaxed. Sometime it happened in the early part of this century. So what are the prospects in sandalwood utilization? It's far and few, but very, very pertinent. You have to establish plantations of seedling origin, no alternative. Encourage growing sandalwood in community forest programs as well as in farmlands. We need to document the extent of diversity again. And the available elite genotypes should be conserved through clonal propagation, though they are very few. So um, if you look at some of the talks that were being uh, you know, uh, given in the last uh, yesterday and to a certain extent today, uh, sandalwood will not fall into that classical, uh, uh, you know, uh, guide of classical tree improvement. We need to reinitiate the basics of tree improvement program, including again identifying plus trees or candidate plus trees in sandalwood. We have to go back. We have to resort uh, going back. Not only that, the need of the R in sandalwood improvement is mass distribution of seedlings. We, we, we firmly believe, IWST firmly believes and tells that, look here, let sandalwood get distributed far and wide from its natural habitat, which is supposed to be, again, considered in northern part, I mean, southern part of Karnataka and northern part of Tamil Nadu, and raising sandalwood plantations and encouraging growing of sandalwood far away from its natural habitat. Uh, uh, I, I would request this August gathering here, all the officers, yes, for all these things to happen, there is something that one factor which binds it, you know, uniform rules and regulations in sandalwood across states is something very much direly required. So I would say that tree improvement, you know, why I'm saying tree, tree improvement here is from the perspective of, you know, the genetic resource at one hand and the utilization on the other hand has crossed the exclusive, exclusive domain of researcher from the perspective of, you know, Collecting the genotypes from its natural distribution area, you know, and that's why I say exclusive domain of researchers and natural population. Yeah, both are out of the purview, but it's, it has to be redefined with a need-based approach, supported with the end users' active participation. And now, believe me, the end users are the farmers, the entrepreneurs who are growing sandalwood. Because fortunately, right now, uh, if I have to say, um, uh, Quite a lot of population, quite a lot of plantations are coming up, and I would say, uh, you know, with the, with lot of uh, uh, happiness, uh, one of the one of the leading state which is growing extensively um, sandalwood is Gujarat, and uh, Gujarat farmers have been trained uh, in IWST and they have taken sandalwood, and I also tell it in a humorous way, uh, in a way that you know, uh, not to cajole or anything like that, but put it in a very humorous perspective. Uh, as a tree improver, or, or, or a tree improvement person, or as a conservationist, I would always say, if somebody somebody from Gujarat takes it, believe me, the species is safe. And to that extent, yes, sandalwood is in the safe hands as far as its, you know, uh, uh, conservation status is concerned. Unfortunately, when you look at IUCN status, though it's categorized as vulnerable, they only look at it from the pers perspective of its natural distribution and do not look at it in uh, uh, you know, cultivated areas. But however, if you see that we have tried to you know, bring that picture when we did update the uh, status. But the harsh truth is there is no natural population existing either in Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. Let us accept the fact. However, you know, uh, I would just give you this small interesting uh, graph, not to, you know, don't take it in a perspective of um, heartbreaking thing, but then just to tell that. You know, when we did a small study of, uh, you know, looking into how exactly is the uh, seized material vis-a-vis -vis, uh, produced in case of sandalwood, uh, ironically, both have touched the x-axis. And, uh, you know, we stopped at 2013-14, and even if we continue up to 18-19 or 19-20, you know, the red dots, uh, you know, move along with the x-axis. The harsh truth again. Uh, yes, this is what I just wanted to show you, uh, friends. Um, I would always tell that, you know, um, as forest officers, I, 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 I would, it's my personal request, please visit this particular patch, and it's the only naturally growing sandalwood that is existing in India, perhaps globally, is in Mariur. And this is one small patch which I have shot as a photograph, called as, it is called as Sudugadu in that particular area, and can you believe all these are sandalwood? 
And the average sand load in that particular small patch, when we took the girth of uh, those trees and when we averaged it, 81 centimeters is the average girth. So what I mean here is uh, Marur plantation is, I mean, sorry, Marur uh, sand load reserve harbors uh, nearly 80, I mean, nearly 58,000 sand load trees distributed in a span, in an area of uh, 15 square kilometers and uh, with a high protection. And perhaps this is the, this would, I would claim this would be the only natural repository of Indian sandalwood. And uh, if you recollect that, I told you that there is, you know, a, a, a photograph shot in 1992 in Jawadi Hills. And here is a photograph that was shot in 2018 by yours truly and uh, from IWST, where we have a very, very good sandalwood tree. Mm, you know, I say with a lot of happiness. Uh, I would just summarize. There are several options and opportunities to revive the past glory of Indian sandalwood, and each of us, each of us here, you know, you, me, and I, and everybody has a significant role to play. So, with this, uh, I would quickly thank uh, uh, my director, uh, Dr. M. P. Singh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk about sandalwood, which is a very, very important species and having a lot of relevance at the country level. And I would also acknowledge some of those people who have been instrumental and who have been always motivating me to do uh, sandalwood, work on sandalwood. Dr. A. Sitaram, retired project coordinator ICR, who was my guide uh, for my PhD studies. And the late Dr. H.Y. Mondram, the doyen of Indian botany is what he's called as retired professor of Delhi University. And my good friend, Dr. Nataraj Karaba, professor, Department of Crop Physiology. Uh, and the Dr. Geeta Joshi, presently the ADG Media and Extension, was also my colleague here uh, in IWST, where we formed a good team and then we worked. And um, before I end my talk, sir, this is uh, the cabinet room door of, you know, carved intricately from sandalwood, which is there in Vidhan Sauda. With this, I thank you all for this patient hearing, and uh, I, I would also, you know, take a bit of a pride in this that, yes, we are ending it at 1.30 as promised, though there was some delay in the, you know, glitches in the technological perspective. With this, I thank you very much, and if there are any quick questions, I'm open for that. Thank you. Thank you very much.